I know we just met, but I have personal confession to make. I do not have the internet connection at home. I'm offline when I'm home. When I share this with my students and friends, they are often shocked. How do you manage? I'm not a tech-hating hermit. I am a fully functioning faculty member, a productive researcher, and responsible citizen, believe it or not. But 2015, shortly after I got my PhD, I disconnected my home internet. I had a fully connected office, but I wondered, do I really need internet after work at home? So I unplugged my home and I remained that way for the last 10 years. Today, I'd like to share the reason why. As a sociologist, my research centers on social fabrics of intelligence. To whom you connected with shapes who you are. Human beings do not develop in a vacuum. The social surroundings hugely influence our cognitive developments. For years, I've studied the relationship between our social networks and neighborhood to our cognitive developments. I published a paper in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA Network, with my colleagues. I show that caregivers with a stronger social network influences their children to have a higher IQ. Surprisingly, toddlers raised by caregivers with a stronger network had notably higher IQ by age two. Strong social supportive network and knowing many people in the neighborhood had a statistically significant influence the infant IQ. How do you make sense of this link? If our intelligence is not a social outcome, Recently, I published another more surprising paper and, oh, sorry, another surprising paper and a scientific report. In this paper, I investigate the relationship between social markers and brain connectome. We can divide our brain into 84 different reasons. When you fire neural signal in our brain, the neurochemicals travel to a certain reason. And more actively, we link certain reasons in our brain. We develop thicker fiber structure connecting those two reasons. So when we scan our brain, we can actually see which part of our brains are well connected. Just using this brain connectome data, we trained algorithm to predict where the children live. Using over 9,000 children's data residing in the United States, just only giving their brain connection data, we let the algorithm to predict where they live, whether they belong to top 20% wealthy neighborhood or they belong to poor disadvantaged neighborhood. Any guess? Surprisingly, when it comes to predict the combination of their parental income and the neighborhood education attainment level, the algorithm can tell where they live with 82% accuracy. 82%. Surprisingly, our brain is deeply rooted in our social surroundings. Social networks and neighborhoods are critical in our cognitive development. So, where do you live? What kind of social networks do you have? Despite the profound influence of social networks and neighborhood, in these days, the social domain is rapidly shifting from offline to online. The average screen time has become six hours, 40 minutes a day. When we're considering connecting to the internet with a computer, this surprising number is just an underestimation. So more importantly, where do you live online? What is your address in your digital neighborhood? What kind of digital connections do you have? 
Nowadays, your digital address is far more stronger influence to your cognitive development. So the digital space. Digital space offers endless options. Movies, clicks, music, interactions that all perfectly tailor for our own taste. Yet, this abundance has a hidden cost. When we are in this individually tailored digital universe, we are insulated from difference. We are sheltered from the perspective that might challenge us. While we are connected more than ever, ironically, we find ourselves paradoxically lonely and alone, walled off in this algorithmically curated vortex. So, in this world, where the internet connects us in unprecedented ways, yet it isolates us in ways that we're just beginning to understand. I summarize this phenomenon as IT. Soliloquy, individualization, time absorption. These three factors began to undermine the depth of human connection. So, intense soliloquy. Online, we rarely converse. Instead, we broadcast. Social media platforms encourage us to share our thoughts, but not necessarily to listen. For example, people post their wedding invitations, birthday party invitations on their social media. What does it mean? Are they inviting all the followers, including the strangers? And it is the word we speak out loud in the absence of the specified audience. Think aloud into the void. We're engaged in a collective soliloquy. Conversations have given way to monologues. Genuine connection, engagement has become scarce. Hyper-individualization. When we log in, each of us enter into meticulously tailored universe, a word that only mirrors our own taste, or at best, those are similar to us. We are addicted to the comfort of the familiar. The digital space insulates us from the different people, those who might challenge our ideas. Yet, human muscles, human social muscles, need challenge, just like physical muscles. Exercise induced Muscle damage is perhaps the most cited mechanism for muscle growth. The idea is that exercise induced damages in your muscle fibers. After workout, your body rebuilds the muscle to be stronger and bigger. Our connecting muscles work in a similar way. But in a word that our experience are narrowly curated by the algorithms, the challenge is in short supply. Our social resilience losing its capability. Our social resilience only comes from the interaction, from diverse perspective. Yet, we are losing our connecting muscles. And the consequence is clear. Higher rates of depression, declining marriage and birth rates, and an intense sense of disconnection and isolation. Lastly, time absorption. Human history has been divided into different phases based on the tools we're using, Bronze Age, Iron Age, etc. Historically, tools we invent save our time. Yet, this unique human invention, especially with AI, does the opposite. It is designed to catch our attention, keep us scrolling, clicking, staring. 
For the first time in human history, we are addicted to our tools. We don't get to addicted to hammers or screwdrivers. But now, ever since we invented the internet, we live for the tool. Rather than freeing our time, the internet consumes our time. Time is the most finite resource. Yet, we find ourselves willingly handing it over to the internet. So, the internet. How does it look like? Let's visualize the contour of the digital space. We often imagine the digital space free, flat, wide open. Yet, its contour is far more intricate and uneven compared to those offline landscape. In a digital space, we can engage. People are not bounded by the geography. We can endlessly consume multiple communities, cultures, interests on a global scale. It creates networks of staggering density and diversity, which far surpassing what offline can ever accommodate. Every interaction online adds a thread to this vast interconnected tapestry, amplifying its complexity. So, digital space is unfortunately are not flat. They're stratified just like a mountainous terrain. Digital abundance is overlaid onto this uneven landscape. Um, I'm trying to, so, oh, is it thing? oh yes, I remember that. So, on a digital landscape, we enter into our unique kingdom. And this contour space, at a glance, it, the digital space glimmers of the promise of freedom. But in its essence, it is a prison. In a digital architecture, the barriers are less visible to users but no less real. In the digital architecture, this barrier shapes the valleys and bridges that determining where users can travel and traverse. This remarkable complexity puts enormous burden on individuals. Choose wisely navigate skillfully, make sense of a word that never stop expanding. <laughs> so today, each of us is more unique and more alone than ever. The internet has crafted us into a social, social animal. In a social dream, we need each other, especially the challenges, differences, diversities. Yet, in this uniquely tailored bubble, the singular word that you face is really the one and only. When you look in, the universe in front of you is the only one. No one on earth share the same landscape. More and more time we spend in the universe, your own kingdom, by yourself only. No wonder why it's so hard to find some and think alike offline. Now the price is clear. We have to deal with unbearable singularity. So, biologically, we are wired for connection. Yet in the net, we are crafted into individualization. Residing in hyperconnectivity, we are rewiring our brain for isolation. This paradox 
asks a deeper question. What does it really mean to live? Are we spending our time in ways that enriches us? Or are we letting our lives just slip by in this endless scroll? In this ever-evolving digital world, the question is no longer, how do we adapt? But how do we really survive in this world that defies commonality? So I disconnected my whole internet to live deliberately, to reclaim control over my time, over my thoughts, over my relationships, simply because I miss the people. Ironically, when I disconnected from the internet, I had more time to explore the world, to work through the parts, to meet people, and to encounter the serendipity out there. Instead of sitting in front of, of my screen, I came back to the world. I'm not suggesting that you abandon the internet. I'm just inviting you to think carefully how you use it and how it shapes your relationship and your brain. My invitation is simple. Reclaim your time. Choose relationship in the age of isolation. If we don't, we risk losing something priceless, the genuine human connection, or perhaps the richness of life itself. And together, we must chart a course in this labyrinth, one meaningful connection at a time, just like today. Thank you.